Hi, this is Professor McLaughlin with a short video on the statute of frauds. This is from chapter seven in your Melvin textbook. And this also goes to enforceability of the contract, just like my video on genuineness of assent. So a contract is enforceable if there is genuineness of assent, genuine, truthful agreement that can't be defeated through misrepresentation or duress or undue influence. And it also is enforceable if it is written and needs to be in writing. So not all contracts need to be in writing, but some do. And if the subject matter of the contract is such that it should be in writing or else it violates the statute of frauds, then a writing is required. So let's break down the statute of frauds. This is a historical statute. We brought this with us uh, through the common law legacy of um, English law. And it's really this idea that there are some contracts that you really want in writing because if there is fraud in the creation of the contract, that would be really bad. So fraud is bad anyway. But what the statute of frauds tries to do is require a writing for those contracts, if I can say this, that would be really bad if fraud were involved. And so the law wants to see some kind of writing or written evidence of the agreement. So even a combination of papers, emails, tech, text messages, memos, um, a handwritten letter, a handwritten note, uh, someone's um, diary, <laughs> a professional diary, notes to themselves might satisfy the writing requirement. So what kind of contracts require under the statute of frauds there to be a writing before that contract can be enforceable. So your textbook covers five different kinds of contracts that require a writing. Contracts that involve the sale of land or sale of an interest in land. Contracts not performable in under one year, that's 12 months. Contracts to pay the debt of another. We all need that, that friend or relative to pay our debts. Contracts made in consideration of marriage. And then contracts for the sale of goods over $500, $500 or more, or lease transactions of $1,000 or more. And this is the uh, subject matter of chapter eight, where we cover um, the sale of goods. So why, why, why do we want land contracts or contracts that involve the sale of an interest in land to be in writing? Well, historically, land could only be inherited by certain people. Um, we don't follow those rules anymore, but what if, what about land causes it to need to be um, memorialized by a writing under the statute of frauds? Land is expensive. Land is historically very valuable, valuable in non-monetary terms. You can grow your own food. It could be a place that uh, shelters your entire family. 
provides food, it passes through generations, there are historical, psych psychological, emotional uh, legacy reasons why an interest in land should be written or else that contract is not enforceable. Land is, when land transfers hand, it's recorded. And so this also explains why your lease contract is handwritten. Uh, oral, uh, you can have a lease agreement. If it's under 30 days, that's oral. So it's with rare exception that contracts that involve any kind of interest in land. So your lease agreement is a non-possessory interest in land. You get to habitate, live in that, that space, but you don't own it. Contracts not performable in under a year. What kind of contracts are these? You cannot complete the performance of the contract in 12 months. Well, anything that says you will consult for us for 18 months, 13 months, over a year, or we have a building project due to open 2022, assuming it's today, 2020, that project is two, completion of that project is two years away. Is it pot? So it is um, almost October 2020. So it's unlikely you could complete a building project before, well, it's possible. But we want to think of situations where that's not how it normally happens or straight up. I need you to consult for me for 18 months. That's not performable in one year or in under a year. So this needs to be in writing. People forget things. What did we say? How long are you working for us? <laughs> we want to make sure things that go on for a long time are written down. Contracts to pay the debt of another. All of us need this person in our lives, this friend, this auntie, my cousin. Who's going to pay my debt? This historically came up when uh, a relative said, if you get all A's, I will pay for your school fees. Or you have uh, aunts and uncles supporting somebody going through school. Maybe in, I don't like that example. I was going to say investing in a small business. No, because that really comes under something else. This is you owe money. Maybe somebody pays off a car. You owe, you are party A and you owe money. And somebody related or maybe not related to you offers to pay off that debt. That needs to be in writing. That could just be an email that says, Hey, Auntie, thank you so much for offering to pay my school fee. Should I get an A? And then a subsequent writing that says, I, I got an A. Are you going to pay? So that needs to be in writing. People forget. It's sometimes over time. Um, all right, let's move on. Contracts made in consideration of marriage. Marriage is about love and togetherness, but at the end of the day, that union is not to, meant to only <clears throat> reflect cis or heteronormative relationships, but that union comes with benefits. So while you may go to uh, have your union recognized in some kind of religious ceremony, it's really the contract with the state that needs to be written because benefits flow to you. Um, you have a different income tax uh, status. You have a different status when you pay income tax. Um, because you are married, you may um, 
be able to visit somebody in the hospital. You are not related, but you are married. Other benefits flow that the state gives you. Insurance benefits. Um, in the state of California, if you are married in the state of California, you have benefits due to uh, community property where half of the marital property is the spouse's. So that contract needs to be in writing and the state makes sure it's in writing. And then finally, contracts for the sale of goods. So the sale of goods, your phone, well, your phone didn't used to be an item that was over $500. Life used to be pretty cheap. And so this seems like a low threshold right now. Contracts for the sale of goods for $500 or more. And we, I don't really spend a lot of time on the lease transactions. So the Uniform Commercial Code governs contracts for the sale of goods. Goods are anything movable. Um, over $500, as I mentioned, that threshold is quite easily reached. But when the Uniform, Uniform Commercial Code was originally written, it started in the 50s. Um, it has been updated since then, but they do not change this dollar figure. figure. So when you buy your phone, that sale is governed by the Uniform Commercial Code. This was the largest television I could find on the interweb. Uh, it's like 110 inches. I found a television, a 98-inch television, that was $60,000. So that's well over the $500 mark. And so that, that contract needs to be in writing. And for the Uniform Commercial Code, that writing could be a purchase order, could be a invoice, could be an exchange of documents that shows that the parties entered into a contract. And that would, sub that would suffice to demonstrate that there was a writing. Alrighty, thank you for joining me. I look forward to uh, talking at you at on my next video.